So let's look at that. Um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16, 13 through uh, 20. We're still in the section of Scripture that deals primarily with um, Scripture's authority over man. And uh, Jesus is moving on and uh, he is confronting Peter and the apostles over his identity. Who does he, who do they think he is? Who do they think that he is? So we're going to see who is Jesus because Jesus has been veiling his identity to the Jews and been speaking in parables and stuff like that. But now he's going to his disciples and he's saying, okay, who do you say that I am? It's important because you're my people. Are you getting it? Are you being able to read between the lines? Are you are you seeing the signs from from heaven? Are you are you seeing the signs in the word? Or are you in, rightfully interpreting who I am? Or are you like the Pharisees who don't get it, who are lost, who are who are not seeing the truth, who are blinded to the truth? So who is Jesus? Matthew 16, 13 through 20. And when we read Matthew 16, 13 through 20, Matthew shows us how man discovers Jesus. He shows us that. So the first thing that we see here is Jesus leaves choice and faith up to the individual. In other words, he gives us the choice to exercise and place faith in Christ. In other words, he's not going to pull strings. He's not going to control us like a puppet on a string. He's not going to put uh, thoughts into our mind. Yes, he will lift blinders off of our eyes. He will help illuminate our mind and help us see. But the ultimate choice to choose him is left up to us. And we see that. Let's look at verse 13 here. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So, like I said, he's, he's leaving it up to the individual. Who do men say that I am? In their own natural, carnal uh, mindset, who do they say that I am? Who do they think that I am? How are they interpreting me, my words, my actions, my ministry, and everything about my life? How do they interpret it? That's what he is seeking from the disciples. And we, we have to realize that this is, like I said, this is a choice. We come to Jesus off of faith. We come to him and on our own volition, once the Holy Spirit has convicted us and has lifted the blinders, it's up to us to trust. And we know that we're saved through that trust. It's not by any works that we have done. It's not by any, any merit that we can muster up in our own being. It's nothing like that. It's, it's contrary and completely opposite to the Pharisaical way. Savannah, you can't give, a, you can't give enough money to get in heaven. You can't do enough push-ups to get to heaven. You can't go to church enough to get to heaven. You can't pray enough to get to heaven. You can't read your Bible enough to get to heaven. You can't you can't knock on enough doors to get to heaven. You can't meet you can't lead enough people to Christ to get to heaven. You can't you can't take communion enough to get to heaven. You can't get baptized enough to get to heaven. You can't buy any souls out of heaven. You can't uh, climb up 10,000 stairs to get to heaven. You can't crucify yourself to get to heaven. You cannot, uh, you can't do any work at all to get to heaven. There's nothing you can do to please God. You are complete. If, if you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, there's nothing in this world at all that can please God. You're, we are an enemy if we have not accepted Christ. The Bible is clear that the only thing that can get this to heaven is by trusting solely in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says. It's for by grace. Grace means a merited favor. It means an unearned kindness. It means something that you that is given to you. You did nothing for. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith in who? Through faith in Jesus. 
And Paul takes it a step further and says, and, not, and that not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God. You don't earn a gift. A gift is given to you. It's given to you because you accept it. You ask for it. You trust that Jesus will give it to you. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Period. There's nothing you can do. You either trust in the death, burial, and resurrection alone, apart from any works, for your salvation. Trusting that Jesus is the Son of God, that He led that perfect life, that He was rejected, nailed to a cross, and that He took the punishment for your sin upon that cross and later rose again. Trusting that all of that happened and asking for, for that forgiveness. If you don't do that, you're dead. Good. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. But the wrath of God abides on him right now. That's John 3.36. Uh, you either have Jesus or you have hell. There's no name given under heaven by which man shall be saved. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus says. One way. One way. No works. No Buddha. No Joseph Smith. No Pope. No jumping jacks. No backflips. No, nothing. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Now, our woke culture will shoot you in the back of the head if you preach that. Proverbially speaking. They hate it. It's too narrow. But guess what? Last time I checked, Jesus said something to us. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. The way has always been narrow. And you can't avoid it. Preach the truth, man. Don't waver from it. Don't compromise it. Don't worry if people hate you. And don't ever let Satan tell you that you are a narrow-minded bigot and that somehow you have it wrong because no one else believes it. It's a, the, the, line, the way that eternal life is very narrow and the line is very thin. And you either have it or you don't. But to see, the way is narrow and the line is uh, thin, but it's well-defined. It's trust in Jesus or die. No works, Jesus only, or die. That's it. That's it. So remember that. We have the choice to make. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But our choice is this. Joshua 24, 14 through 15. Now therefore, fear the Lord. Serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell but as for me and my house we will serve the Lord. There is a narrow way that you there is a narrow way that is secluded from everyone else in your land, and you either choose to take it or you're rejecting And it's not popular. It's not popular. People will hate you for it. Hate you for it. So that's the first thing that uh, that Matthew shows us on how man discovers Jesus. He shows us that we have to realize that the choice is up to us. Once Jesus takes the blinders off of your eyes, you've got to choose to accept Him and Him alone. Period. There is no other way. But number two, the natural carnal man will always misinterpret Christ. Me and Oscar went over this in discipleship on last Tuesday. People are spiritually blind. They can't see. They can't see, Chad. They cannot see. You could preach and preach and preach and preach and preach and evangelize and evangelize and evangelize. And if the Holy Spirit does not take the blinders off of their eyes, they're going to misinterpret Jesus every single time. 
They're not going to want him. They're not going to. Want, they're not going to want to desire him. They're going to put a different label on him. They're going to misunderstand who he is. They're going to misunderstand what he has done. They're going to try to get to heaven in every single way but the right way. If the Holy Spirit doesn't act, the natural carnal man will always misinterpret Christ every single time. They are totally incapable of coming to him on his own, on their own. Jesus says that if any man comes to him, the Father must draw him through the Spirit. The Spirit must take the blinders off their eyes so they can see and then they can choose. But until then, they ain't getting saved, you guys. They're not seeing. And that's why before you all go out and you do your evangelism, I'm not talking about a five-minute prayer here. Before you even come out here and do your evangelism, you should be in your house pouring your heart out to God, not only confessing your sins before Him and repenting, but begging Him to open up hearts and minds and to bring you the right people to evangelize. And then once you get here as a group, you need to pray again and pray for God to open up hearts. Pray for God to give you boldness. Pray God to go before you and prepare the hearts and minds to receive the gospel because without that, they're not getting saved. It don't matter how well you follow the script. It doesn't matter if you hit every single point on the script. It doesn't matter if you eloquently present the gospel perfectly. If the Holy Spirit's not in it, they're not seeing it. They're not seeing it. They're blind. They will explain it away and misinterpret him every single time. Let's look at that. Who do men say that I am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I, that I am? See, everyone else is misinterpreting me. You know, some people think that I resemble John the Baptist. Remember, that was Herod's idea. Herod thought that he was John the Baptist that was raised from the dead. He's getting all messed up over that. And some people think that he was Elijah, and that was such a big conglomerate mess that when he's up on the cross, people thought he was calling down Elijah. People had no idea who this man was. They had no clue who this man was. They did not know. They were so blinded to it that they were putting every label on Jesus except for Messiah. They were so blinded to it. Some people thought he was Jeremiah. Some people thought he was other prophet. They had no clue, Oscar. They had no idea at all. They were so blinded that they were saying stupid stuff. They couldn't see. And Jesus is like, but who do you say that I am, guys? You've been with me for all these years. You've, you've heard my teaching. You've heard me explain these parables. You've seen my miracles. You know my background. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And, and that's, that's a big thing because here's what it comes down to. As I said before, look at what 1 Corinthians 2.14 says. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Not getting saved. But you had some people here who believed Jesus was the Messiah, who were seeing it, and who were interpreting him correctly. And our boy Peter, Mr. Foot in the Mouth Peter, who often thinks before he speaks, chimes in here. And this time he doesn't stick his foot in his mouth. This time, he just speaks off the cuff immediately. In the Greek, it, it's almost like he immediately chimes in. He doesn't even hesitate. It's like, boom. He just blurts it out. And what does Peter say? The man who has the propensity to trust will interpret Christ correctly. So remember that. Here's the difference. The natural man will always interpret him, but those who have the propensity to believe, those who, who God knows will believe, God will take the blinders off of his eyes. And our boy Peter comes through for us because look at what he says. Simon Peter answered and just blurts out. Doesn't even think. He just blurts out and says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The word Christ in the Greek means Messiah. He is flat out saying, You are my Messiah. 
You are the son of God. Guys, right there, at that very moment, you're seeing something. Peter just gets born again. This is the moment Peter gets saved. He sees it. He sees it and he blurts it out. The blinders are taken off of his eyes and he confesses it. It was that simple. He didn't give to the synagogue. He didn't take communion. He didn't get baptized. He didn't do anything. It was a simple confession of faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. That simple. That simple. And the reason why he did this is because God knew from eternity past that Peter would accept him if given the opportunity. And at that moment, God took the blinders off of Peter's eyes. Peter saw and he was able to accept him. Let me defend that. Romans 8, 29 through 30. This is God, Peter describing what, I mean, Paul describing what happens at the moment of salvation. He says, for whom he foreknew, for whom God foreknew, in, in eternity past he knew who would accept him, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So in other words, in his plan for human history, he knew who would be saved and he predestined them to be saved because he knew that they would accept, okay? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestinated, these he also called. So in other words, he predestinated some to be saved based on if they would accept Jesus or not. And those who he predestinated, he called. In other words, he called with the gospel. And those he and these he also justified, which means he declared them righteous, which implies that they accepted the gospel. And whom he justified, these he also glorified, which means one day, he's speaking from eternity here because the context is, you know, he foreknew them. When he foreknew them, everything else was already set in stone, guys, as part of his plan. One day, he will glorify, which means he will be risen and given that new body. It's already set in stone. This is eternal security. But notice, I'm not saying that this is arbitrary. It was based on his foreknowledge. It was based on his omniscience, knowing who would accept the gospel if presented. That was the difference. He knew. He knew that Peter would accept. So he took the blunders off of the eyes and let him see. And Peter saw and he chose. <laughs> that is what ended up happening here. So the man who has the propensity to trust will interpret Christ correctly. Period. He will interpret Christ correctly. But look at the next point. God knows who will believe and reveals Christ accordingly. But Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That's just another word of saying that God has lifted, the Spirit has lifted the blinders off of your eyes, guys. You're no longer blind. You can see it's been revealed to you. And you accepted it. See, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And Peter kind of retells this because this resonated with him. So look at what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. He said that he was elect or uh, that, that, that people who are saved are elect or chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. He's saying the same thing Paul did, that you are chosen according to the foreknowledge of who would accept Jesus. A beautiful, beautiful thing. And Peter, uh, Paul goes on and says in Ephesians 1, 5, having predestinated us to the adoption of sons and by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. 
predestined, predestined, predestined. This is heavy, heavy, heavy stuff. But God knows who will believe in, uh, and reveals Christ accordingly. But look at the next thing. Jesus commissions all who are, who are saved to spread the gospel. Matthew 16, 18 through 19. He says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now here we go. Let's get into some Catholicism here, right? Mm -hmm. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in, or loosed in heaven. Now the Catholics will ride with this and say, see, Peter's the first pope. And they'll just go off of the rails using this verse to, 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 to defend that. But let's look at what the verse says and what it doesn't say. What does the verse say here? He says that you're Peter. So he changes his name from Cephas to Peter here. He gives him a Greek name. And the word Peter means stone or rock. Then he goes on and says, and on this rock, it's wordplay. It's a different word. Uh, Peter is the Greek word petros. It's masculine, petros. While rock is the Greek word Petra. It's feminine. So Petros means little stone. But Petra means big boulder. Little different. Little different. Little different. Okay? So he says, you are Peter. You are this little stone. But upon this rock, this big boulder, I will build my church. Now, here's the thing with that. In the Greek, in order for two things to be correlated, they have, uh, see, because rock is, is, is being used to describe Peter here. It's been using adjectivally. And in order in the Greek for that to work, you have to have both words as the same gender. But as I've already said, Peter here is masculine and rock is feminine. Grammatically, it don't work. It don't work. Grammatically, it's off. So, right there's the first problem that you have. And we're going to get into that here in a second. But, it says, And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So, you'll build the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And we've seen that throughout the ages. That, how many times has the gates of hell tried to squash the church, guys? I've tried to destroy us. More times than not. But every single time they try to, try to destroy the church, what ends up happening? We just grow faster. We thrive under persecution. We don't crumble. The gates of hell will never, the gates of Hades will never, ever, ever prevail against it. They won't win. The more pressure they put on us, Oscar, the faster we multiply. General rule. We thrive under pressure. And I've always joked with uh, Heather, it's like, boy, Satan must be very prideful. He must, have, he must be the most arrogant being on the face of the planet because he's arrogant enough to try the same stupidity over and over and over again, thinking that if he puts enough pressure on this church, he can start it. He can stop it. But every single, time, every single time he tries to do it, we just get get more influential and stronger, you would think he would just give up and let us uh, let us crumble under our, our own stupidity, wouldn't you? But no, nah, no, nah, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. See, the most effective thing Satan could do is just to leave us alone. Because we'd destroy ourselves. We'd crumble under our own sin. We'd become so apathetic and complacent that we wouldn't even look to God. But the thing is, is God in sovereignty allows Satan to be unleashed on us because he knows that pressure causes us to grow. And that's the point. Pressure causes us to look up. Pressure causes us to make sure, make, uh, causes us to realize, oh, I don't have any control over my life. I need a little bit of help. So that's why he does it. And I will give you the kingdom, uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, now the keys of the kingdom of heaven. How do you get to heaven, guys? What do you, what's the key to heaven? What must you have in order to get to heaven? The gospel. That's what that means. We'll give you the gospel. 
It's not like you and you alone are the way to heaven. Like you're some sort of pope figure. It's like, we'll I'm give you the word of truth. We'll give you the good news. We'll give you the gospel. Don't start reading junk into the script, into the passage that's not there. Compare scripture to scripture, right? Okay? And he says, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And, and that's just the two wheels being matched up. It goes back to the Lord's Prayer. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So that's just the idiom saying, you know, as long as you follow me, my will and your will will be in, be in check. Now, the Catholics try to use this to show that Peter is the first pope. That's an issue on many levels. And, and we're going to go over exactly why that's the case. But, as you can see here, the main thrust of this passage is that Jesus is commissioning Peter with the gospel here. He's saying, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of God. And you're going to have power to preach my word. And you're going to have power to bring other people to the Lord so they can confess the same thing that you just confessed. So grammatically speaking, and, uh, and contextually speaking, the rock on which... Uh, God built the church. It was not Peter. It was actually his confession. It was actually the fact that he placed faith in Christ. Contextually, that's what he's talking about here. It's his confession of the gospel. That's the rock he built upon. It's not Peter. It don't work grammatically. It don't work theologically. It, it contradicts scripture. It can't be that way. So it's got to be something else. It's the confession. And it makes sense, but look at Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the same commission. That's the point. Uh, that's what Peter had received. But why are some of the reasons why Peter's not the Pope? Well, here's a couple of reasons. I already mentioned the first one. Grammatically speaking, the Greek word Peter is the masculine noun, and the rock is feminine. They cannot modify each other. Grammatically, it don't work. Number two, let's look at number two here. The concept of a pope is not found in this passage. Even some, uh, how Jesus, even if by some how Jesus was using poor grammar to refer to uh, Peter being the foundation of the church, it would mean that he founded it, not ruled it. Because Peter was kind of like the founder of the Jewish church. But he wasn't the ruler of the Jewish church. Who's the head of the church? Is it Peter? No, the last time I checked, Paul says that the head of the church was Christ. So let's don't get confused there. Likewise, this foundation would have been shared with the other apostles and prophets. See, notice this. Was the foundation uh, Peter? Look at what Paul says. What was the foundation? What was the church built upon? The church having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone the foundation was Jesus all of the apostles and the prophets who foretold Jesus that is what the church is built on not Peter if you want to call the uh, foundation a man it would have been all of the apostles all of the prophets and Jesus himself See, it's contradicting Scripture, guys. The sweater's unraveling here. When you take the Catholic claims and run them through Scripture, it doesn't match up. When you test uh, the false prophets by the Word of God, testing the spirits to see if they're of God, running what you're being taught through Scripture like the Bereans, and seeing if it matches up, you're starting to see contradictions. You're starting to see where it doesn't add up. You're starting to say, whoa, something's up here. We have some teachers here violating Deuteronomy 13 and 18 here. This can't be it. Let's go on and look at more. Number three, Peter was not a supreme authority because Paul rebuked him for being wrong in Galatians 2, 14 through uh, 16. Look. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, you being a Jew live in the matter of the Gentiles, not as a Jew. Why do you compare Gentiles that live as a Jew? 
We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified in faith and not by works of the law, for by works of the law no flesh shall be justified. See, Paul is rebuking Peter here. If Peter is somehow the first pope, if Peter is somehow supreme over all, of the entire church, if Peter is somehow in charge of all the other apostles, why is the little measly Paul rebuking him? We have a problem here. Right? We have a problem here. Let's go on and look at number four. Paul outright condemns many, it should be many, Catholic doctrines in one passage. First uh, Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies to his spot in his hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with the hot iron. Look at verse 3. Here's the Catholic doctrines. Every one of these doctrines are practiced by Catholicism. Every last one of them. Forbidding to marry. The priests can't marry, guys. Forbidding to marry. Commanding to abstain from uh, foods. There's a whole dietary law in the Catholic Church. Yeah. All right? Which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and to know the truth. So you have two things there. Forbidding the Mary and abstaining from foods. The Catholics hold the both of those. And Paul is outright forbidding both of them in one verse. So again, and, 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 and but notice, what's the context here? Who's going to be doing this? Those in the latter times who depart from the truth. Uh-oh. What does that say about Catholicism? I'm saying. Number five. The word Pope means father in Latin. It's the Latin word for Papa. Latin word Papa, which means father. Okay? The Bible forbids man to call any man father in a spiritual sense. Look at what Jesus says. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Uh-oh. They call the Pope father. We have yet another contradiction, Oscar. We have yet another one. We're getting into trouble here. Number six. The word Pope wasn't even used until around 500 A.D. when Pope uh, Syracus applied it to himself. He called himself father. It became a title. And every single bishop, Roman bishop from then on, inherited the word Pope. But something a weird happened. It applied to every Roman bishop until Pope Gregory the Seventh, somewhere between 1075 and 1085. But somewhere between 1075 and 1085, Pope Gregory the Seventh took that title and applied it to everyone before everyone before Pope uh, Syracuse, which means 1080, uh, 1073 to uh, 1085 is the first mention of Peter being called a Pope. It's a thousand years after Christ died, guys. A thousand years. You don't have any mention of it until Pope Gregory comes along. It's not only a heresy, it's a relatively new heresy. Relatively. I mean, it's a thousand years really new, but in the grand scope, I mean, it took half the church to even adopt that heresy. Half, half the life of the church. A thousand years into a 2,000 year old church. So, it's like, come on, guys. So, <laughs> Peter's not the Pope. It doesn't hold up to the scrutiny of the passage. There's all kinds of contradictions in Scripture about it. He's not the first Pope. He was an apostle. He was an apostle. And he shared the foundation of the church with the other apostles, prophets, and Jesus himself. So I guess if Peter's somehow the Pope, all the apostles were Popes. And so were the and so were the prophets, and so was Jesus himself, I reckon. See how this could really spiral into some sort of sacrilegious heresy? Because it is. It is. We can't do that. But Matthew shows us how man discovers Jesus. Like I said, first, 
Jesus leaves choice and faith up to the individual. Second, the natural carnal man always misinterprets Christ. Third, the man who has the propensity to trust will always interpret Jesus correctly because God lists the blinders. Because that's number four. God knows who will believe and reveals Christ accordingly. Number five, Jesus commissions all who are saved to spread the gospel. And lastly, Jesus commands to hide, not hid, to hide the gospel from the Jews. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Why? Because once again, the whole point was the Jews have to reject the sin of the cross. So they were hiding it until after the resurrection because he had to fulfill Isaiah 53, guys. He has to be rejected. So he's revealing these things to those who had the blinders lifted out their eyes, but he's forbidding them to tell anyone else because he has to be rejected. He wants them to see uh, who, who he, he wants the Jews to see who he is the same way the apostles did. To look at what was written in the Bible, to look at his, to hear his teachings, and look at his miracles and piece it together and figure out on his own who is he. Later on, he's going to save a big group of Jews on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 total. They're going to come to the Lord, but they got to reject first. And that is why he is hiding from the Jews. He is saying, do not tell the Jews who I am. Do not do it. So, guys, that is Peter's confession. When you read this Passage. Don't let the Roman Catholic Church who do you on that. It is a relatively new heresy that completely contradicts Scripture, completely eisegetical, which means they're reading it into the passage, and and it's just not the it's just not the case. There's only one way to heaven, and it's not by doing the second the, the seven sacraments of the church. It's not by do, uh, the Roman Catholic Church or anything like that. You have all of these heresies that they do. Do you realize the heresies that, that the Roman Catholic Church do on a regular basis? I have some of them written down here. Here are some of their doctrines. If you think that uh, calling Peter is the first pope is bad, listen to some of these other things that they do. It's their works-based salvation, working to get to heaven, the seven sacraments that you have to do to get to heaven. The indulgences, which is one of the uh, seven sacraments. Indulgences is buying people out of purgatory, giving enough money to save them from hell. Okay? They elevate church tradition to the same level of authority as the Bible. So if the church said, if, which is the Pope, by the way, so if the Pope says something is authoritative, don't question it. It doesn't even matter if it contradicts the Bible. It's authoritative. That's what they would say. They believe believe in purgatory. They believe in baptismal regeneration, which means you've got to be baptized to be saved. And here's a dinger. They believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary, that she stayed a virgin. Well, the, 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 the Gospels refute that because we know that her and Joseph had babies after, uh, after Jesus was born because Jesus had brothers. So we know that's false. You know, they believe in the sinlessness of Mary, that Mary was that Mary was sinless. They believe that Mary is a co-mediator and co-redeemer. That somehow we got to pray to Mary, that she redeems us. Now they call it the veneration of Mary. You know how they do their Hail Mary and bow down to the statue of Mary and all that stuff. There's not a lick of difference between veneration and worship, guys. They're Mary worshipers. There's not a lick of difference. They can put whatever whatever label they want to on it, but it's worship. It's worship. They're venerating not every other Mary, but they also pray to pray and venerate saints. If you go into a, a Catholic church, they're going to have their little uh, statues and, and images of all the saints, like St. Saint Peter and St. Saint, uh, saint Valentine and St. Patrick and all these saints, and they venerate and pray to the saints. They even pray to angels. And the I, I don't know the verse right off, but the Bible expressly forbids that. 
forbids that. Uh, because I, I forget where it is, but, they, but the Bible forbids the worship of angels. Prayer is a form of worship, guys. That's all it is. But they believe communion saves. They believe the bread and wine during communion become the literal blood and body of Jesus when you eat it. That's why they're, they're, you could say that they essentially believe in cannibalism, I guess. You know? They believe the church is a political state. Think about the Vatican. It's considered a country. They're blending the church and state completely together and making them the same thing. That contradicts scripture big time. We're supposed to be separate from the world, not intermingled in it. And lastly, there's many, 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 many more. I just gave the ones I can think of. <coughs> These are just the ones off the top of my head. Guys, please. It's a prevailing thought, and I, and I come across conservative Baptists that are confused on this. People call these people brethren. The vast majority of indivi these individuals, there's no way to know the Lord. Their doctrine's too far gone. Their works based salvation. Doctrine's full of heresy. They're praying to Mary and the angels and saints for crying out loud. You know? They're, they're too far gone. Are some Catholics saved? Yeah, I'm sure they are. There's some nominal ones who don't that that have accepted the gospel along the way, but generally speaking, their gospel, their their doctrine's too far gone, guys. They're not Christian. This is the world's biggest cult. It is, and we have to realize that because you can't lead them to the Lord until you realize that they're lost. And I know that you have Catholic family. Yeah. And you got to come to that realization, Oscar. You're not doing anyone any favor if you just try to sweep that fact underneath the rug. You're not. It's dangerous. So let's pray for those who are deceived and ask for God's help to reach them but not to compromise and just stick to the Bible and not give in to all the noise. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the day and thank you for our, uh, for our service today and for the uh, good message that you gave me. Uh, please be with us and bring us back uh, safely tonight. But we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.